welcome to our guests that we have some guests from down at Impact Church. Thank you guys for coming up. That's Kim and kids. Kaylee. Uh, they're going to kill me later for doing that. Anyway, uh, thank you all for being here this morning and welcome. Hey, we are in our series, The Rich Life, but I'm going to do like a really quick commercial because we're starting a new series in two weeks and it's called Walking Through the Bible. And we're going to touch on six different biblical characters throughout the Bible. And, it, and what I wanted to do, which is what we did at Impact when we did this series, we actually put a timeline, Kim was part of this actually, a timeline all the way around the, the, the church of what happened where and when all through the Bible. We actually had someone attending at the church who thought Moses and, and uh, Abraham and on and on and on, we all lived at the same time. So we felt, hey, we need to uh, kind of stretch that out. But I looked at the building here, and I wasn't sure how we were going to do that with the beautiful columns and everything. So you're not going to get the timeline, unfortunately, but really looking forward to do this. So that'll be in two weeks, because next week is Mother's Day, and we're going to do a, a message on a godly influence. And so we hope to see you back then. But we are currently in our third uh portion of the series, The Rich Life, and this, if you're tired of hearing messages about what you have and what you need to give to God in the way of money and tithing, today's the final one, so you can applaud to that or not. Don't applaud, I'm only kidding. Uh, so we're going to be looking at that, and, and what is the rich life? We were discussing this, right? We were looking at this. What do you compare yourself to? What We talked about the Joneses, everybody knows the people across the street who have th maybe have things we want. We compare ourselves to them. I wish I had that. I wish I had this. So we wanted to say, what does biblical uh, finances look like? What does it look like to have a rich life? Do you have to have a lot of money to have a rich life? What we've been talking about? No, a biblical rich life is what you have because of your relationship with the Lord. We looked first at, at um, Abraham and Isaac. Abraham was asked to give up the most precious thing that he had, and we looked. What are the precious things that we have in our lives, and what can we do with those and appreciate those and not be concerned on earthly wealth, but what God has given us that's valuable to us? Last, year, last week, we looked at the dishonest steward, and, and we really weren't sure what we should get, but we learned that we can learn things even from people that don't do things the right way. Because what he ended up doing was he started to prepare for his future. He knew he was going to lose his job, so he decided, this is what I'm going to do so that when I get into this situation, I'll be taken care of. And we, we took that and we applied that to the Bible and to our lives on how should we be preparing for the future. Do we focus now on our bank accounts and everything and storing up money for our retirement or whatever it is, which again, are not bad things. But if that's your, all your focus is, we should be looking to storing up treasures in heaven. So we talked about what we have. We talked about uh, what we give. And today we're going to look at what we get. Oh, you say about time we talked about what we're going to get. Well, no, it's not quite going to be like that. We're going to be in uh, first, or 2 Corinthians 9, 1 to 15. So if you would turn there, I would appreciate that. We're going to, today we're going to look at, uh, take a look at where we need to start and where we can find lessons on generosity. So we're in 2 Corinthians 9, 1 to 15. I'm going to read through that now. This is Paul writing to the Corinthian church and he says, I don't, I really don't need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem, for I know how eager you are to help. And I have been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many at Macedonian believers to begin giving themselves. But I'm sending these brothers to be sure you really are ready, as I have been telling them that your money is all collected. I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you, we would be embarrassed, not to mention your own embarrassment, if some Macedonian believers came with me and found that you weren't ready after all that I had told them. So I thought I would send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready. But I want it to be a willing gift, not one given grudgingly. 
Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. And then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. And in the same way, he will provide and increase your resources when you produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God, for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Thank God for this gift, too wonderful for words. So what exactly is happening here? Well, Paul had left the Corinthian church and they were just really excited and they said, we're going to collect an offering and send it out to the church in Jerusalem. And now Paul is in a Macedonian church, and he's telling them all about the Corinthians and their response and that they want to send this gift. But it's been a year now, and the gift hasn't come. So Paul's going to come and visit them, and he's going to bring some of the members of the Macedonian church who, because of what the Corinthians were doing, were giving and taking up an offering. But what Paul's really trying to do is encourage them, if you haven't really taken the the offering yet let's get that going because I'm going to send a couple to just help you get that done because I don't want to show up with the Macedonian church members who are so excited because of what I've been telling them about you and have us get there and you don't have the offering together and so that's what the the crux of this letter is all about so we're going to look at three places to start in talking about what we get and then we're going to look at three lessons on generosity So the first place that I would like to start is we need to examine our hearts. Verse 1, I really don't need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem. Paul really knows their hearts. He knows that they want to take up this offering and give it. But he just wants to kind of be there and kind of encourage them in this way. They, we need, they needed to, and we need to take an inventory of where we are in our walk with the Lord. Does he hold preeminence in our life? We can't wait. I will tell you this, you can't wait for it to happen. It isn't just going to happen. You have to prepare. You have to be proactive. Does, he, does the Lord hold preeminence in your life? In your life. You know, we can't wait for change to happen. We need to be proactive, take an inventory of where we are. We need to look at how far we've come and continue to grow and follow Jesus. Lamentations 3.40 puts it this way. Instead, let us test and examine our ways. Let us turn back to the Lord. Instead means let's stop complaining and looking at the things that we don't have and let's examine what we have done and where we are in our maturity process. Now one viewpoint, our viewpoint of what kind of stewards of God's wealth have we been? That's what we have to look at. How have we been stewarding the gifts that God has given us up to this point? If we look at 2 Corinthians 13, 5, it says, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you And if not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. We are called to constantly take an assessment of our lives. Where are we in our walk? Where are we with our relationship? And that's really easy to do. Where are you in your Bible reading? Where are you in your prayer life? And where are you in your giving of what God has given to you? And we've talked about that. God's given us far more than money in the bank. 
He's given us gifts. He's given us talents. He's given us ways of helping. He's given us many things that we can give to him as a sacrifice to him by helping someone else. So we've looked at all of that. So we, if we examine how we have stepped out in faith and obedience, and we find that we've been neglecting to obey in faith, that shows an evidence of a lack of strong faith. If you haven't been obeying and following God in faith and doing what he's called you to do, then maybe your faith isn't as strong as it could be. So what we need to do then is to understand what's being asked. We need to understand what's being asked. Verse 2, for I know how eager you are to help, and I have been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it is your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. So what are we being asked to do? We have to understand what we're being asked to do. We, well, we should be tithing. Okay, you say, Pastor Chris, finally, it's taken you three weeks, and now you're talking about money. That's right. That's what the church does. The church just talks about money. All churches, they just want money. You know, genuine faith knows the truth. Leviticus 27 says it very clearly. One-tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord and must be set apart to him as holy. Well, you could say to me, that's an Old Testament verse, it's passe, that really doesn't apply to us now. Okay, how about Matthew? Matthew 23, 23 says, What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites? For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. They had gotten down to such detail, minute minutia of all these laws they added to the Ten Commandments, and they were so engrossed in that, they were missing the bigger picture as leaders of the children of Israel. They were, they were bypassing justice, mercy, and faith. They weren't giving the, 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 the sheep that they were leading the proper leadership. So... We should not stop tithing. And I want to just go back real quick. When I, we say tithe, most people know that as being 10%. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But 10% is a figure I want, I want all of you to say, there's no limit on what you can give. This was a, this was a, a percentage that they, they, were, they taught in the Old Testament. But it should be out of your heart, and it should not stop at 10%. You sh there are tithes and there are offerings. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But tithe is not just 10%. You can give more than 10%. That's a place to start and move on from. So I just wanted to, to... So there's a familiar verse. This is the one you've all probably heard before. And it is in Malachi 3.10. It says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. So there's a promise there. You do this. Test me. Test me. Do what I ask. Give a tithe. Give back from what I have given you. It's a form of obedience. It's a form of sacrifice. Do it. And I promise you, I will open the windows of heaven to you. I will take care of you. I will bless you. I found a commentary here a little section, and I wanted to read it because it really says it better than I could even summarize. It says, the Old Testament tithe is not the upper limit. In the New Testament, Christians are encouraged to excel in this grace of giving. That's from 2 Corinthians 8, 7. Remembering that they owe everything to the one who for their sake made himself nothing. God offers his people the challenge of testing him. By this offer, he virtually guarantees them a direct and abundant return on their investment. His storehouse of blessing is unlimited. So we really need to move in our attitude of giving in the church and giving to other people from I have to to I want to. It's all our attitudes. 
It's all our motivation. Why are you doing it? God wants a cheerful giver. He wants you to give it because you know, because of your relationship with him, because of what he has done for you, that this is something I want to do in some form of payback to him for what he has done for me. He's not commanding. He wants it to be a part of thanksgiving and worship to him. We should be enthusiastic with our gifts. We should be enthusiastic with our gifts. It should bring illicit joy to give back to and to further the reach of the gospel and, to, and the work of his church. Because that's what you're doing when you give here. You're advancing the gospel and continuing the work of his church. You give money here, we give to missions, we, give, we keep the lights on. We do many different things with the money that, that, that God has given you. And I guarantee you, if, if you say, you know, I can't afford it. I can't afford 10%. It doesn't work with my budget. Test him. Test him. Sacrifice. Take the 10%. I'm sure you will not see how you will have enough money at the end of the month to do that. And I guarantee you, God will provide it in one way or another. That's what he says here, because you're doing it in an attitude of wanting to, of wanting to sacrifice and give back to him. He's going to bless that. I have seen it over and over and over. And it should be from your gross, not after taxes have been taken out, your health insurance has been taken out. If you get that in your job, it should be the gross amount because that's what God gives you. When he called these people and they had their harvest and they had their food, they took 10% before anyone anywhere else, even to their own tables. That 10% came off. And so that's a guideline because it should be from your heart, not to go, okay, God says I have to give a dollar for every $10. I have to do it. No, it's exactly the opposite. You should say, because God gave me that $10, I should give him at least a dollar back. It's all his money. He's given it to me to do with what I need to do I must give it back to him because he's asked me to give it back to him. This is the way that Christians can follow Christ in, in his sacrifice, right? Christ made himself nothing for us. Remember that? God came down here and became human and took all that he did, abuse for us, and gave his life for us. Is not the least we could do to give back what God's providing for you in the fact that you have a job or wherever your income comes from? That's all from him. That's all from him. And it's an opportunity for us to join in the sacrifice he made. We can make our response to what Christ has done for us in praise of good deeds and giving to others. So what does he say about our response? He says the windows of heaven will be open. The storehouses will be overflowing. This should blow your mind. Absolutely blow your mind. But you say, nope, it's mine. I'm not giving any back to God. I earned this. This is what I get for my 40 hours, 50 hours, how many hours I work. I sweat it. I broke my back for it. I'm not giving any back. Nope, it's mine. You should be, it should blow your mind to have the ability to give back to Almighty God, the creator of the universe. He says, give to me the little you have, and I will give you more. So the third place that we need to start is then we need to realize accountability is not an evil word. Accountability is not an evil word. Verses 3 through 5, but I'm sending these brothers to be sure you really are ready as I have been telling them that your money is all collected. I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you. We would be embarrassed not to mention your own embarrassment if some Macedonian Believers came with me and found that you weren't ready after all that I had told them. So I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready. But I want it to be a willing gift, not one given grudgingly. So I don't know what happened with the, the Corinthian church here. Maybe they kept saying they were going to do it, but they really hadn't collected it yet. And that's what Paul was afraid of for multiple reasons, because he had been boasting about this church and what they were doing, and he didn't want them to be embarrassed when it was time and the money had not been collected. But this is really was a form of accountability, wasn't it? I'm going to hold you accountable. I'm going to send these two men, because if it's not collected, they're going to help you to get that done, so that when I do bring these two guests with me, there will be no need for anyone to be embarrassed. We need to encourage each other 
through example, keeping each other accountable. In all aspects of our walk, accountability is essential. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. Now we're not talking rubbing two pieces of paper together here or something soft. Iron is hard. And when you strike iron against iron, sparks are made. Sometimes it has to be something pretty hard, right? But it always should be gentle in the way that you present it to someone else. Hard to hard, rough, sparks, refine and make better. That's what should be your goal and the message from your heart. I'm trying to, to help all of us be better. So accountability is a good thing. Luke 17, 3 says, so watch yourselves. If another believer sins, rebuke that person. Even if there, and then if there is repentance, forgive. We, we need to remember that. Even in the outside, the aspect of money and tithing and what's God's and what's ours. If a brother sins and you go to him and you talk to him and, and it's in the bus spelled out in the Bible how that should be done. When you go and talk to him, if they repent, there has to be forgiveness. Isn't that what God does to us daily as we ask him for forgiveness for things we've done? You repent and he forgives. We have to help people along with that. There's, there's, there's good accountability. So who is it that you know who tells you that the church shouldn't be talking about money? We've all heard that. Church shouldn't talk about money. Money has no place in the church. Well, you know what Jesus did? He talked about money and mammon probably more than any other subject. If, did you know that? So if Jesus can do it, maybe you shouldn't be hanging around with the person who's telling you that the church shouldn't be concentrating on it because all the money that we have is God's. Originally, it was all his. Paul is giving the Corinthian members the opportunity and the encouragement to do what they already had promised to do. He was sending fellow servants to come and make sure they had it collected before the guests from Macedonia came with him. And when we hold each other accountable, it is not to be done legalistically. Make sure of that. You don't come to someone legalistically. This, isn't, this is where the story of the, the speck and the log, the speck in your brother's eye and the log in your own. Don't go trying to find that speck, the thing that your, your brother is doing wrong, and remove that from his eye. When you have a log so big in yours, you can't even see it. What does that mean? Make sure your own life is straight before you go and accuse a brother. So that's why I said it shouldn't be legalistic, but it should be done in love. And, and boy, it, would, it helps if you have a relationship with that fellow believer. Because then if you go and you talk to them about this, like how's, how's this going, how's that going? Now, I'm not suggesting you go up to, the, to your friend here and say, how's your giving going? How much did you give last week? No, that's between each individual and the Lord. But it is something that we have to remember through Paul's example that we need to be accountable to one another. We need to be accountable to one another. It should always be in an, an attitude of loving encouragement. Remember, this is what the Bible instructs for us to do, to do it as, as unto and with the Lord. So when we look at this now, there were three places to start. We need to examine our hearts we need to understand what's being asked of us, and that's to tithe and give back to the Lord. And we need to realize that accountability is not an evil word. So when we look at the rich life and biblical finances, they're the places we need to start. Examine your heart and see where you are. Understand what he's asking you to do. And then realize that when you're held accountable for that, however that is, and you'll know it at the time, that you're willing to submit to that, repent, and be forgiven. Now I want to look at three lessons on generosity. Three lessons on generosity. What is generosity? It's having a heart that wants to give. You know, I've, I've, we've spent a lot of time up front in this series talking about analyzing what it is you have in the Lord. What are your blessings? What is it that you have to give? I hope each one of you has taken an inventory of that and recognized, you know, it's really easy to look the negative things in your life. They're usually right in front of us, right? 
and we really won't concentrate on them. The problems we have, the issues we have, the interpersonal relationships that aren't working, the kids that have issues, the parents that have issues, the, the issues with our friends or with our spouses, there's, there's something always in our face. You know, the devil really wants you to keep there. Because if you keep focused on that, you're always going to be unhappy and you're always going to be not focusing on him. But I will tell you, no matter what the situation is in your life, no matter how bad it looks, you can find something, a blessing there if you look for it. It's always there. It's always there. And I can give examples that would take up a whole other sermon or, or two. But the, the thing is, I want you to be prepared of what does it mean to be generous and focusing on the things that you have and the good th things that you have in your life. If you come from that perspective, everything will, this will all make much more sense. So if we go to verses 6 through 9, the first thing I'd like you to understand is your generosity is a choice. I hope you all know that. It's your, it's your own choice. God leaves it up to you. Remember I said it's between you and him. So we look at verse 6. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. And then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered. You have to decide whether you believe and trust that he will do what he said he will do. That's really the bottom line. I could sit down right now. That is the bottom line. You've heard here what he says he'll do if you obey and you give back what he will do to you and what he will provide for you. So it all really comes down to, do you believe that he will do what he says he will do? When you give back to him what is already his, he promises to bless and give us all we need. Isaiah 32, 8 says, but generous people plan to do what is generous and they stand firm in their generosity. You have to make a plan. You have to be intentional. Remember, I said you can't just sit back and wait for it to happen. You have to be, as in many things in life, you have to be proactive. You have to be intentional about it. It will never happen without, without forethought, prayer, and obedience. When you're looking at your bills and you're looking at your budget and you're trying to figure out what you have there, if you take that 10% out of the thing before you, out of the number, before you set up your budget, that's being intentional. That's deciding I am going to obey, I am going to give back to the Lord what he's asked, and then he'll provide everything I need beyond that. Now, if you give your 10%, there's not going to be a Maserati in your, par in your driveway the next morning. That isn't what I mean by giving you all you need. God knows what you need. There are wants and there are needs. We all know what our wants are. We all know what our needs are. God and God knows the desires of your heart. You know that the more you obey and follow the, the living Savior, he wants to give you the desires of your heart. Now, they have to be in line with, with his will. You can't be crazy about it. You can't be unreasonable about it. But he wants to give you the desires of his heart, of your heart. He wants that. And so he's saying, test me. Test me. I'll provide what you need. I'll even provide when it's part of my will what you want. He will. Proverbs 11, 24 to 25 says, Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper, and those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. It's a little counterintuitive, isn't it? Give freely, and then you'll become wealthy. Now, hold on. I am not, this is not prosperity gospel. I'm not saying you give the Lord, you're going to be rich. When I say wealthy, when that, well, I don't say it. When Proverbs says wealthy, they don't mean you're going to have a mansion next week because you're giving to God. He's going to 
just flood you with everything you want. I just said a minute ago, that's not going to happen. But he is going to say, I'm going to provide everything you need. And when it's in my will, I'm going to give you the desires of your heart. You don't give to become more wealthy or wealthier. I said this earlier. I will comp re repeat it multiple times. It is your motives and your attitude that God looks at. David speaks about it, that he doesn't want, ta he doesn't want sacrifices. He wants a heart bent to him. That's the sacrifices that the God wants from us. He wants us to give to him everything we have from our love, our obedience, and, and we give that to him. That's when we are his children. That's when he says he knows us, and that's where a relationship is built. So the biblical understanding of the riches of God is giving to people, and we will be blessed, and we will be refreshed. That's what it said. So number two would be, your generosity will change who you are. Your, generation, your generosity will change who you are. Verses 10 through 11. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those we, who need them, they will thank God. When you purpose within yourself that I'm going to step out in faith, give back, bless others with what he has given you, he can only change you in the inside. That can only make a change you internally in your thoughts in your love for him. Generosity inside of you, that's what's important. That's what matters. The generosity inside of you. And you'll be enriched in every way. Look, the God of the universe has enough for you. He has everything you could possibly need. Every one of us in this room, God has exactly what you need. He's the one that created this world and universe with a word, with a breath, with a wave of his hand. He has everything that you need. Yet we hold on to what we have like God can't do anything for us. I have to do it for myself. God's a great God. He created this world, but I don't really know. He's not down here helping me. He's not tying my shoes. He's not paying my bills. He's not here. I have to take care of those things. No, that's not what his word says. No, he's not going to tie your shoes. But he is going to take care of you. He knows your needs. He knows what you, what you have. And he knows what the desires of your heart, what your desire of your heart is. He has more than you could ever get yourself or that the world could ever give you. And we are not called to be generous for what we're going to get back. I want to keep repeating that. You don't do this for what you will get back. I know it's really hard like this. God says, do this and I will do this. But I'm telling you, don't do this so that he'll do this. That's kind of odd, isn't it? That's an oxymoron. God says, if you do this, then I will give you this. But I don't want you to do this so that I'll give you this. It's your motivation and your attitude. If it's coming from inside, if it's coming for a love from him, if it's coming from thanksgiving to him, that's the attitude he wants, and that's what he says. When you do it with the right attitude, I'm going to give you this. Don't do it to get something back. But the second thing that he said that was so, so wonderful is that we get the, he'll get the glory when we give to others. Acts 20, 35 says, and I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. It said in, in this verse here that then God will get the glory. So not only will you be giving back to him or as the Corinthian church will be giving money to help the church in Jerusalem and they would thank God on their behalf. 
so when you, so we t- I talked earlier about tithes and offerings. You've heard that. The tithe is what's expressly stated in the Bible that we're to do. It's what the Israelites were to do. It's the way they kept the Levites living, right? Sacrifice and all the things they gave. That's how the Levites who didn't work, but they only served God in the temple. That's how they were able to, to manage living. An offering is above and beyond your tithe. Oh, Pastor Chris, now you're telling me I got to give 10% and you want me to be glad about it, 10% or more, but now you're telling me I need to do more. Yes, but again, it's your heart. It's what is between you and God. An offering doesn't have to be more money. An offering could be going to somebody's house who can't, who just got back from surgery and mow their lawn. An offering is something you're giving up, a sweet aroma up to God. And that's where God then, those people are going to thank God for what you did. If you sacrificed your time, if you sacrificed your energy, that's how God's glorified. So you are doing that as an offering back to him as well as you're helping someone else. The third thing is your generosity will change others. So it's going to change who you are and it's going to change others. Verses 12 through 15, finish out the verse. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. And as a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God, for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Thanking God for this gift is too wonderful for words. Tithes and offerings are between you and God. And God will be glorified. And it will be above and beyond how people will be blessed. Romans 12, 14 says, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Oh, yeah, I'm asking you to do that, too. (laughs) Bless those who persecute you and don't curse them, but pray that God will bless them. Well, pray for your enemies. We've heard that. Jesus said it multiple times. Pray for your enemies. Pray for your enemies. Why would we pray for our enemies? To raise them up to God. To ask God to deal with them, that's not our place. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to act like Jesus Christ. You have to forgive them in your heart and pray that God would make a change in their life. That's how we're called to bless others doesn't just have to be money it can be money you know of a friend right now who's struggling in some way or another how can you help them that's what the bible that's what jesus that's what paul calls out here for us to do find out where someone needs you to bless them because they're then going to bless god and thank god for the good work that you've you've done Philemon 1.6, and if you know the story of Philemon, he was a slave, he came to know the Lord, and he, he ran away from his Christian owner and ran back to Paul, and Paul said, you need to go back. So I'm going to send you with this letter, and I'm going to beseech your, your owner, Onesimus, that he will take you back. I'm sorry, Onesimus was the slave. Philemon is who the book was written to from Paul. And he asked Philemon, please, re- please accept him back as a brother in Christ. Forgive him and allow him to come back. We're called to do the same thing. And he says in Philemon 1.6, and I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. Being generous will change you on the inside and being generous will help you change others. What do you think it meant to Onesimus that Paul wrote that letter for him? What do you think it meant to Philemon that he was being called to live out his faith and to be forgiving? That's what we need to do. So when we start seeing our blessings that are found in Christ, 
we start to see our viewpoint of our finances, our possessions, our gifts, our time, our abilities in a whole new way. We should experience overwhelming gratitude and a desire to obey in giving back and also blessing others out of our immense wealth of biblical riches. You are all rich in Christ. Swallow that for a second. You are all rich in Christ. You have the God of the universe who promises you, give back to me and I will bless you. Give back to me and I will provide for you. Change other people's lives by giving back to me, giving them your time, giving them your talents, giving them your money if they need some help. So I, I said, we started this out, I talked the first week about what you have, last week about what you give, and this week about what you get. What do you get? You get blessed, you help others, and you glorify God. It really comes down to a heart condition. What is your heart condition? How do you see others? How do you see God in light and what he's given you and what he asks you to give back? So in closing, we get to be generous. So my question to you is, are you missing out on that? Are you missing out on that? Every week I have verses at the end of your program there and you may wonder why they're the same ones every week well eventually I hope that you get to see the repetition that you memorize the verses I did the same thing Pastor Mike did this first but now I know I've memorized all these verses and their and their uh, reference and if you sit down with an, anyone an unbeliever that's the gospel message right there I also did the Jesus instead of me. My favorite thing, just three things. He died instead of me. God sees Jesus instead of me. And now I live for Jesus instead of me. That's what I've been talking about the last three weeks. Living for Jesus instead of yourself. Obeying what he asks you to do and giving back, recognizing the riches you have in him and how, how he asks you, what he asks you to do with them. So when we look at this, if you know, don't know Jesus, these verses are for you. And many people say that the people in churches all think they're better than everybody else. And it is so the opposite of the truth. Every one of you, I hope, is sitting here because you know you're not better than anybody else and that you need a Savior to save you, and that's why we're here. You all recognize the sin in your life, and you know that I need a Savior and so all like-minded people who believe that they're saved by Jesus Christ and because they have that sacrifice on their behalf, they can go to heaven. That's why we're in this building. That's why we accept anybody, no matter what they've done in their life, because Jesus can forgive them. Well, Isaiah 59, 2 says, it's your sins that have cut you off from God. We were all cut off from God the day we were born. We were all cut off from him. And there's not one person except Jesus who hasn't sinned. Everyone has sinned, says Romans 3.23, and we all fall short of the standard that God has of righteousness. So if you're talking to someone, you say, I'm no better than you are. God doesn't set up a hierarchy of sins. This sin's worse than this sin. God sees all sin, the white lie to murder. He sees them all the same because they're all trespasses against his righteousness. So you say to them, it's your sin that, and my sin that cut us off from God and we're all the same. Every human here is all, we've all sinned. But there was a penalty for that and that was death. We were going to be eternally separated from God. We're doing a study in, in Sunday school and Revelation. We're talking about, you know, sometimes I think we take it lightly because we know it really doesn't affect us because we already follow Jesus and we hear what others are going to go through. But uh, Tom said this morning, what about your friends and family? What about the people you know that you never witnessed to that have already passed on? I, I like to use the illustration of the, the, the train tracks and the bridge has fallen down and you know the bridge is not there anymore and that train is barreling down the road heading right for that ravine. 
and you're the only thing between that train and the ravine, what are you going to do? Are you just going to step back and watch the show? Or are you going to get in front of that train and wave your arms and shout and scream and get that conductor to stop that train? That's what we are in this world with your friends, with your family, and anybody you might meet who's open to listening to you. What's changed your life? So we were all going to die, but the free gift, that but is a beautiful B-U-T. The free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the promise. That's what we have to look forward to. And so what does that take? It says, I recognize I'm a sinner. I recognize I have no way back to God but through Jesus. And I declare that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. If you do that and you allow the Holy Spirit to change your life, you are saved and you can realize that you are never going to have to be separated from God for eternity. So I would love for you to keep reading those verses and memorize those verses. And maybe one of these weeks I'll say, so what's Isaiah 59 two? And you'll all, re all reply and we'll go through them because I would love for that message to go out into this community, right? Amen? All right. Please remember that everything you have, God has given you. Be generous with that. Be loving with that, what you give back. And it doesn't all have to be money. It can be the gifts you've been given, the talents you've been given, the energy you've been given. I mean, Randy's got unending energy. Right? And he's out there helping as many as he can. All of us need to be doing that. So when we look at biblical riches and the rich life, realize how rich you are. Recognize what God has given you and be anxious to give it back to him and to others. Father, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to come together and read your word and try to understand what it is you want us to hear, what you want us to know. Lord, we love you. And we're not going to stop at the fact that we just are grateful and thankful that you saved us from eternal separation from the Father. But you've also called us to be your ambassadors and to go out and bless people in our lives, to, to show the love of Christ in giving back to people. And you've promised, test me. If you don't believe me, test me. You said, give of what I've given you and I will give it back to you and give you even more. Sowing and reaping, that's the story. The more you sow, the more you will reap. So, Father, we thank you. And if there's anyone in here who doesn't have that relationship with you or even understand this, Lord, I ask them to come to you first and acknowledge their need for you 